My name is Mark Peck. I am the manager of the Shad Gallery of Biodiversity at ROM and a member of the curatorial team for the special exhibition, Wildlife Photographer of the Year. I'm delighted you could join us for today's Digital ROM Connects program. I want to take this opportunity to thank the Schmidt family for their ongoing support of this program. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the ROM sits on what has been the ancestral lands of the Wendat, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Anishinaabek Nation, including the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, since time immemorial to today. And I am grateful to live on this land. Today's program is in support of our current exhibition, Wildlife Photographer of the Year, at ROM until April 24th, 2022. Wildlife Photographer of the Year is developed and produced by the Natural History Museum in London. We would like to acknowledge the support of Royal Exhibition Circle donors in making this exhibition possible. The Wildlife Photographer of the Year competition attracts tens of thousands of submissions from photographers of all ages and all skill levels every year. The exhibition's stunning images allow visitors to experience nature in vivid detail and to get up close to some of the world's most extraordinary species, their lives they live and the challenges they face. Wildlife Photographer of the Year offers photographers an internationally acclaimed platform to showcase their work while celebrating our beautiful planet and encouraging us all to think differently about our impact on our shared home. During the program, please submit your questions via the Q&A feature on the screen, and we will have some time at the end to answer your questions. Today's speaker is award-winning photographer, Martin Greg Gregus Jr., who is joining us from Vancouver. Martin is an award-winning young innovative photographer and documentary filmmaker with over 15 years of experience already in photography. Martin has dedicated much of his life to capturing wildlife, beauty, and people's stories through images and film, both in the cities and nature. During the summer of 2020, Martin decided to brave the mosquitoes and document wildlife in Hudson Bay. Through his stunningly intimate images of the complex life of polar bears, Martin shares the stories behind his rising star portfolio in the 2021 Wildlife Photographer of the Year competition. Please join me in welcoming winner of the 2021 WPY Rising Star Portfolio Award, Martin Gregus Jr. Thanks, Mark. Thank you so much for the very warm welcome. And uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you for uh, joining today. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, seeing all the names pop up from uh, around Canada and around the world. Um, today, let me uh, let me take you on a little journey. Let me take you on a journey, not just for the polar bears, but uh, a journey back 17 years. That's how long I've been uh, a photographer for um to the start of it all so what we're gonna see today is uh images and pictures all the way back from 2008 uh all the way up to uh the polar bears that uh, you saw awarded at the wildlife photographer of the year um i mean here uh <laughs> while i'm talking about myself uh this is actually us uh traveling out to where the polar bears are in our little man-made camp um but we'll get to all that in a minute here um where it all started um i've been doing photography since i was eight years old um my father a photographer and a, and a filmmaker uh kind of got me into it um i stole his camera when i was young and um we've kind of been going uh, on expeditions together ever since i mean as the presentation goes on you'll see me reference and talk about we uh, when I say we, that is exactly who I am talking about. It is uh, my father uh, who <clears throat> helps me uh, as we uh, travel across the world taking these pictures. Here we are once again um, on top of our camp, which has sort of this picture with the drone has actually come to symbolize our expeditions. Everywhere we go, we take this one overhead shot um, of our camp. But anyways, 
Um, my photography. So in uh, 2008, uh, I was no veteran to the Wildlife Photographer of the Year. In 2008, I was specially commended uh, by this picture. And it is a simple picture. It's of a seagull. It is taken with a very simple uh, camera. Back then, it was only six megapixels. I mean, some questions may arise um, about the style of photography and equipment uh, you need. But I always uh, tell everyone, you know, it doesn't matter the equipment you have to take the picture. It is a matter of the vision you have in your mind. Um, this picture being precisely that. And then uh, after 2008, um, I was awarded at the Wildlife Photographer of the Year once again in 2010. This picture was actually the winner of the 11 to 14 year category um, at that time. Um, and it actually just so happened to be the last time that um, I entered the Wildlife Photographer of the Year in 2010. Um, after that, I kind of took a little uh, little break from, from competitions in general. I was very young. Um, those of you joining us today from, from classrooms and, and students and young photographers uh, passionate about following their dreams, you know, I was... Um, when you're that age and you enter a photo competition and you don't necessarily win, it kind of plays with your mind a little bit and you kind of get discouraged. And I stopped entering contests and uh, it wasn't until 2020 that I entered the Wildlife Photographer of the Year again. Um, but as uh, someone who's presenting to you here today, I want to encourage you to enter the competition and not necessarily follow in my footsteps uh, from that point of view, because just because um, someone says, um, your picture isn't going to be the winner doesn't mean it isn't good enough. It just means it wasn't necessarily the one selected in that batch, which is exactly what I learned, um, <laughs> in the seven years that I didn't enter anything. Um, and, um, most of, or some of you that have been following my photography know that I haven't actually been uh, doing wildlife photography this entire time. I'm actually also a documentary photographer. Uh, we have our own photography studio for portraits and fashion, stuff like that. Come from a very artistic background, which is where this came from. Um, but as um, my photography developed, I was met with a certain degree of criticism from wildlife photographers where it was almost not to say forbidden but it wasn't it was an unspoken thing where if you're a wildlife photographer you should only do wildlife photography so I actually stopped kind of sharing these images from uh, our cities our streets um, and I started to focus more on wildlife photography even though this is still very much something I do I mean here's a picture from San Francisco um, in Italy, uh, wherever we traveled uh, with my father and my family across the world, we always sort of focused on these images when wildlife wasn't present. Um, ultimately, photography is my passion and I want to do it wherever I go. Um, probably one of the reasons why I say I've never actually been on vacation because <laughs> uh, even when I am on vacation, I'm still getting up at four in the morning to take pictures. Um, but there's also a very fine line between um, documentary photography uh, and nature. And sometimes those things coincide to form images like this one, which was actually awarded at the European Wildlife Photographer um, of the Year. Another kind of quick step back. I'm actually uh, not Canadian. I wasn't, I'm Canadian now, but I wasn't born here. I'm from Slovakia in Bratislava. Um, which allowed me to enter these competitions as well as a uh, European. Um, so yeah, after um, kind of traveling and seeing the world a little bit, um, I took a step and I did my first photo series back in 2013. I was still in high school at the time. Um, it was funny because actually what would happen is I would get up at six in the morning I would drive out with my dad, we would go out into the marsh, we would go find these snowy owls, we would go take pictures of them. And then by nine o'clock, two hours in, I would uh, hop in the car, hop on the train, hop on the bus, uh, just in time to sort of make uh, the second class of the day. Um, I did this for about uh, three months uh, for a period of two years, capturing these snowy owls that have made their way into the lower mainland, capturing images 
kind of like this one again something we are not necessarily used to i mean we're not necessarily used to seeing um snowy owls in these numbers but for a period um in 2013 there was a huge um sort of uh gathering of these owls uh in the lower mainland and we tried to um capture them i mean some of these images um they might ring a bell to, to some of you. Uh, back then, these were actually published in a few magazines and news articles. Uh, this one was actually on the front and page of the North Shore News, and I believe the Toronto Star. Um, so that was sort of my first introduction to the photo series. And then after that, it kind of escalated. I uh, did a little photo series on uh, bald eagles and the salmon migrations, not necessarily quite as uh, successful in the form of uh, being shared uh, internationally, but um, quite stunning for me nonetheless. I mean, just a little insight onto this picture because it is one of my favorite from the series. Uh, this is an eagle, we named him James. <laughs> um, I ran into him every single day for about a period of two weeks and um, I built a relationship with him. We saw each other every day. I liked to think he knew who I was. Uh, and then one morning I got up and I crawled in the mud and I sat down on the riverbank and actually um, James was across the river and he came by and uh, sat on this log right beside me and uh, he brought me a salmon dropped it off kind of near my feet and then went on and uh, sat on his branch so just by being out in nature um, I mean as we'll get to the polar bears there have been very many sort of intimate moments that I've been able to get um, part of that series, of course, was also the salmon migration as they make their way from the Pacific into our rivers, uh, working underwater to capture uh, various images and series uh, to sort of complete the series. Um, but yeah, sort of after this, uh, we are now around 2015. Um, we started a project on Canada. Uh, it was called Thank You Canada. At the time, it was meant to document uh, our country, both na nature, people, serve sort of all aspects that make us as Canadians and um, sort of share with the world for the 150th anniversary in 2017. So we traveled um, to the majority of our cities, to every single province and territory over a period of around three years, uh, capturing, I'm going to just share with you right now the natural aspect, but sort of capturing everything from the people to the nature. I mean, we have wild horses in the Rockies, um, grizzly bears in the Great Bear Rainforest. The whole idea of the project was to capture images that we don't necessarily see. At the time, you know, some of these techniques that we were using, drones, underwater housing, stuff like that, were unique to some of these species. Um, and we were trying to showcase that. I mean, we have humpback whales. Um, and then, of course, one of my favorite pictures of all time, a kayaker uh, in Nunavut, uh, um, right next to a huge iceberg. Um, this project not only introduced me to our country, but it also introduced me to our north and the Canadian Arctic, which at the time, I didn't know what a great impact it would have on my career. I mean, 2015 was the first time I visited the Arctic. I went up to Pond Inlet um, in May. And then later on, um, later on, I went to um, the Northwest Passage later on in September and October. Um, and it was the Arctic and I fell in love with it. You know, the beluga whales, the polar bears, and I just kept coming back year after year, even after this 150 project was finished, um, which actually it isn't. It was meant to be a huge coffee table book, which we're still working on and developing to this day and kind of changed the aspect. It's no longer for the 150th, but it will come out eventually, I swear. Um, but yeah, so uh, we went up north over and over again, documenting the belugas and then documenting the polar bears. Um, and this is the sort of image of a polar bear that we're so used to seeing, you know, a polar bear in the winter, in the snow, that is just such a um, common picture. But it wasn't something I was necessarily looking for. I wanted to capture polar bears 
um, in a different way. And after this, um, I again, once again, took a little break from Canada. I got an opportunity to travel down to Antarctica, um, traveled down there uh, for 20 days on a, on a ship in the very end of their summer. So we got everything from rough sea snowstorms. There wasn't that much wildlife but as you can see by the landscapes it is an extraordinary place it is one of my favorite places in the world um it is antarctica as you can see it is absolutely stunning um and the leftover of what penguin colonies were there in the summer they were just uh starting to head out to sea which we see this little guy traveling across the snow um Funny enough, I mean, not funny enough, this was quite an uh, extraordinary event. This is actually a uh, pot of killer whales chasing uh, penguins. Um, at the time when we were seeing this, we didn't know that a docu uh, David Attenborough came out with a documentary where literally this exact same series was. So we actually got it back to South America, to Santiago. We sat in our hotel room, we watched the new documentary, and there was this exact same series of the orcas hunting the penguins. And me and my uh, best friend kind of just sat there jaws on the floor like wow we literally just saw this firsthand in Antarctica and here we are um but then a part of that trip it was four months I was in South America and Antarctica we went up the coast we went to Chile and Argentina this is of course towards the Alpine and Patagonia uh we hiked 150 kilometers around the mountains uh capturing sort of the spectacles and all that Patagonia has to offer. And again, in a time when no one really goes there, because we were there in the autumn, this is the threshold of winter. Um, and it was quite interesting, because again, we were met with conditions that uh, make this area what it is. And, you know, uh, that was extraordinary for uh, pictures just like this. Uh, and also like this, that's actually my best friend hiking um, uh, in Torre del Paine. This was almost towards the end, uh, 150 kilometers over six days. We were quite exhausted, blisters and everything. I don't have to get into it, but <laughs> if anyone wants some more, ask, ask away. Um, but yeah, after that, I uh, went back to Vancouver. And then shortly after, I went to the South Pacific um, where we are currently developing another project on the islands, not necessarily, this is French Polynesia, Bora Bora, but not necessarily just these islands, but also the South Pacific as a whole, documenting these islands before they disappear. Um, again here, uh, using sort of under a mix of over drones, underwater techniques to sort of capture the full aspect um, of this region. Uh, this is funny enough, this was actually on my birthday uh, in, 20, <laughs> in 2019. Um, but yeah, so after the South Pacific, um, that was in 2019. That spring, we were hit by the pandemic, exactly what we are all facing right now. And um, all of a sudden, I couldn't travel. I couldn't go to my favorite destination. Couldn't go to Antarctica, South America. All of this was closed off. And... Um, so I decided to travel within within Canada once again, uh, being asked to sort of come up to Churchill and um, work there in 2020, scout out new areas and take some uh, pictures. We were able to document polar bears in such a way that I want to say it has never really been seen before. You know, again, we're so used to seeing polar bears in the winter in ice. Uh, we were capturing them in the summer and we we're actually capturing them thriving and being really healthy and happy. Um, this picture, some of you may recognize it. It was published in Canadian Geographic earlier this year. It is a polar bear and a grizzly bear hunting together. It is the first time ever this has actually been seen in the wild that I know of or documented at least. Um, such an extraordinary moment. And this was just at the start of our expedition. Now, I often get asked the question about, you know, climate change and um, global warming and all that. The main thing that we saw, the threat that faced these bears was the unpredictability of ice 
and our climate and things like that. I mean, in 2020, uh, the ice in the Hudson Bay, at least in the area where we were blown by uh, in by uh, winds from the east, uh, stayed around for quite a lot longer than it we were used to. So in July, we were still seeing ice and polar bears hunting on ice. Great for the bears, not so great for us because we were there with a set deadline that this is the amount of time we can dedicate to this project. And half of that was spent just waiting, waiting for these bears to, to come to shore. Um, eventually they did. I mean, these pictures are what you remember from the Wildlife Photographer of the Year. Personally, this is probably one of my favorite pictures of all time. This is a picture we dreamt of in 2015 when we first saw a polar bear swimming on the Hudson Bay with beluga whales swimming underneath it. And at that time, I said, okay, we need to capture this and get in the water with this polar bear. And ideas came to mind of how we can do that. We modified gear, build a custom camera boat, which didn't end up working at the end. Um, but ultimately, we were able to capture this picture. And of course, um, the series of these polar bears making their way from that ice you saw earlier, making their way across the Hudson Bay to shore. Uh, utilizing sort of all of this custom gear on the spot decision making to capture moments like this and to me pictures like this that I've taken are there's just something extremely humbling to me about them just because it took so long to capture you know it wasn't it ended up being you know five minutes but the process of getting there was you know well over five years so um, after we documented these bears coming to shore, we made our way to, um, to shore on the Hudson Bay. This is our camp. That is my bear guard, Hino, swimming. That water, mind you, is about zero degrees. It is the Arctic Ocean. He swam in there every day. He's crazy. Um, but yeah, this is, uh, this is our camp. Actually, if you look closely enough on the, on the boat, you will see uh, the little window in the front in the tarp. Uh, we didn't want that window to be there. Actually, a polar bear came and ate his way through in the morning. <laughs> um, and then we decided to sort of just put a window there because there was a little hole. Um, but that sort of was our life for in 2020. That was our life for 14 days. And in 2021, that was our life for 20 days. That's how long we lived with these bears. And we were able to capture extraordinary moments I mean you know you're waking up every single day and you're right there you know you don't have to walk anywhere you don't have to do anything you look out your window and this is what you see and that was absolutely mesmerizing I mean it took a huge toll on us I mean getting up every single day four in the morning um you know give you a rough idea we wake up at four in the morning go shoot for about two three hours have breakfast take a nap um go take some more pictures um take another nap you have to sleep when the bears are sleeping because you're not really going to be sleeping at night especially not in 2020 um but you know you work with the bears and you build that relationship with them um this here is actually a little cub we named hercules um you don't see it in this picture but he actually only had three legs and he was two years old at the time we didn't know if he was going to survive because obviously that is a huge disability for a polar bear that uses his hind legs to pounce on prey but he was very resilient and very reliant on his mom but also very stubborn and willing to survive and actually i'll, I'll share with you that uh in november of this year i was actually contacted uh, by a gentleman who actually saw him in the Arctic without his mom, but thriving, looked very healthy. Uh, and so seeing that and actually seeing sort of the outcome that the Wildlife Photographer of the Year has had on me, you know, reaching far corners of Canada and, you know, internationally to sort of bring these people together that when they do see a polar bear, that guy, ha you know, mentioned or messaged me and said, listen, here he is. I think you know him. Uh, that was really heartwarming. Um, again, here we have another picture, which 
I'm sure you are all familiar with. Uh, it is a mom and her first year Cubs nursing. Um, seeing this was one of the most humbling moments of our polar bear expedition, seeing the mom nurse. Um, again, you know, we put 14 days of our lives into the living with these bears. We built a very strong relationship with them. The outcome of that relationship was intimate images like this, where the mom felt safe and comfortable with us that she could nurse her cubs. And to me, like still, I get goosebumps thinking about it. You know, that was even this year when we saw it, you just have to, you're taking pictures, but sometimes you just sit there and you just have to watch because it, it lasts a little while and you're just in awe. Like this is really happening. And this mom really trusted us. She was around for 10, maybe more of the 14 days. And uh, in that time, we babysat her cubs that she left by our camp and went off to forge for a few hours. She nursed um, all of these things, which was really um, different compared to sort of the behavior we are taught uh, polar bears exhibit. Um, again, one of my favorite images of polar bear swimming through the fog. Um, the main awarded image at the Wildlife Photographer of the Year. Um, two female bears, sisters, um, hugging a rock. They were actually play fighting uh, for quite some time. I want to say 30 of uh, 40 minutes. They were playing in the water. So we kind of went with the drone. We captured this moment. And I love how they form a heart, uh, very visually um, representation of our expedition. Um, Another picture here awarded at the Siena Drone Awards, not the Wildlife Photographer of the Year of a bear sleeping as a storm passes by. Um, again, utilizing sort of every piece of equipment in our toolbox to capture moments like this. You know, some of them we had remote control cameras, underwater housings, drones, sort of using everything and putting it into one package to, to capture moments like this. Um, and again, this one too, one of my personal favorites uh, uh, uh same bear actually that you saw earlier with uh on the rock one of the sisters sort of sleeping on the on the edge um that is our uh polar bear expedition um today specifically for this presentation i saved one picture for all of you and that is this one um has not been showcased anywhere else but here. Uh, this is a little preview of what is to come. Um, if you have any questions, I'm, we're gonna shortly here, I'm gonna play a little video for you. Uh, shortly here, we're gonna have a Q and answer uh, period. But if you have any questions that don't get answered, that's my Instagram right there. Feel free to message me. Um, I answer or try to answer all the all the questions that I get on there. So feel free to message me at any time. And again, um, stay tuned because uh, we have a lot more images to share with you from our 2021 expedition, which have not actually been shared anywhere until here today. Um, with that in mind, I'm going to share with you a quick video and then we're going to get into uh, the questions.
that um, wraps up uh, this presentation. Mark, welcome back. <laughs> Thanks, Martin. And, and thank you for a really wonderful and beautiful presentation. And thank you for joining us in the program today. And I hope that all of you out there will get the opportunity to visit the museum and visit Wildlife Photography of the Year. Uh, the great news is the museum is opening back up again on February 2nd, and hopefully we will stay open from then on. So for the next several minutes, Martin and I are happy to answer questions, or actually I'm going to ask questions and Martin's going to do the answering. Uh, and let me get right, right at it. Um, so Martin, how do you select topics or areas to photograph, especially for a series? Yeah, I mean, uh, a little bit of work goes into it from sort of passion projects, you know, like uh, if Antarctica comes up, Arctic, I'm immediately interested. Um, but also sort of selecting topics that are not so much documented. I mean, you know, we live in an age where, you know, you have so many documentaries and magazines covering so many topics, but so much of our world is still left to be explored. Um, and sort of by traveling to these areas around the world, I always talk to the local community and sort of pick out, you know, that's that's interesting. Maybe I'll document that and sort of stay in touch with them over time and potentially plan expeditions in the future. So, yeah, sort of just listening. <laughs> Great. OK, quick one for you. Favorite animal to photograph this year? Uh, I mean, polar bears must be on the list. I love owls, but uh, they've sort of topped it. <laughs> All right, uh, next one. What advice do you have for young professionals interested in traveling the world to capture photography? Is it best to find a team or organization to work with or plan to do it on your own? Uh, I mean, working on your own is extremely expensive. Um, personally, from experience, I recommend finding sort of an organization. Um, if you're interested in working as a guide a little bit, that always helps sort of having certification that enables you to be more attractive to that organization and then working as a guide developing your photography on the way traveling the world with that company um that's pretty much the best way to do it if you're really on a tight budget i mean if you have the money for it you know just <laughs> pick a topic and, and go travel but for the most part that's what i would recommend all right i i would be a very bad person if i didn't ask this question right away from my grade three students why did he have to go to sleep the same time the polar bears do? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, uh, literally just because that was when there was nothing happening. And I have, you know, major FOMO. I miss, I like, I want to be out all the time taking pictures. So when the bears were sleeping, that's when I wanted to be sleeping because I was guaranteed that I'm not going to miss anything. So that's <laughs> in the sum of it. Okay. Um, how much equipment have you lost in your shooting experience? We all know as photographers how expensive camera equipment is. Is it something you worry about a lot? Uh, yeah, I mean, especially flying drones. That is, uh, I always, my heart skips a beat whenever I sort of get an error. Um, luckily, I haven't really lost anything. Every single trip, I break something. Um, it's come sort of like a tradition, unfortunately. Uh, so when I see something break at the start of a trip, I'm like, okay, well, you know, that's probably it. <laughs> uh, and that usually is it. It's just, I know that something is gonna break. I just never know what and it, how expensive ultimately it's gonna be. Okay. Um, would you say that the bears becoming comfortable with you could negatively impact their interactions with other humans? Uh, no, I, a lot of these bears, we could tell they were been tagged. They've been tagged in Churchill. So a lot of these bears have experience with people already. Um, and our interactions with them aren't negative ones. You know, we make sure that they know that we, to an extent, need to be respected and that we can hurt them for their sake. You know, we're respectful of their space. We don't cross a border that we form with them. Um, and ultimately, they never look at us as someone, you know, that gives them food, gives them anything. We disassociate that completely from them. So they, our goal is to be as invisible as possible. Great. The animals seem comfortable with you and the drones. How do you use drones in a way 
that doesn't scare the wildlife or disrupt the natural flow uh, or behavior of these animals. Yeah, I mean, again, it's uh, the same way that we use ourselves. Uh, we introduce ourselves over a long period of time, get these bears, not just bears, animals in general, used to our presence, let them know who we are, let them know our scents so that, and our sounds, uh, so that when it comes down to actually shooting it, um, these bears know exactly what they're up against. They know that we're not an enemy and we're not actually going to harm them. So, you know, it's not something that we rush into. It's literally just building a relationship over a, sometimes an extensive amount of time uh, that allows us to, to capture these pictures. Great. Okay, so the Arctic is a, a potentially dangerous and, and pretty drastic environment at times. Do you ever feel any experience or do you ever experience any extreme and dangerous weather? Do you ever have concerns about risking your life to photograph bears in these instances? Uh, yeah, I mean, of course. I mean, not necessarily from the bear aspect. I barely ever feel unsafe with the polar bears. Oddly enough, uh, it's the Arctic environment and the weather that I feel unsafe about. I mean, particularly in 2021, uh, there were many instances when I was really scared and messaging, I have a satellite phone messaging on the satellite phone, like, hey, things are a bit dicey right now. Like, you know, pretty much I love you guys if anything happens. So it does, from a weather perspective, it is an extremely challenging environment, no matter how prepared you are. Like we prepare months, sometimes years for these expeditions. And then certain things happen that you didn't, think would and you just have to act on the spot and hope for the best sometimes like okay corinne's got a, a question i think everybody wants to know about how were you able to get the pics alongside the polar bear in the water safely yeah i mean we built uh this uh camera boat almost like an underwater drone with an underwater housing in front worked perfectly in our swimming pool um <laughs> got up to the arctic tested it in the water worked great got it out on the water with the polar bears didn't work so great so ultimately we ended up um hunkering down in a little boat uh with a monopod and an underwater housing and waiting for a polar bear to to swim by and uh again sort of taking ourselves out of the equation being as invisible as possible and then the outcome is what you saw at the wildlife photographer of the year amazing all right. Do you have a net, a, another adventure planned? Yeah, I mean, too many, unfortunately, for my family and my girlfriend. I think they're all getting a, <laughs> a headache from my trips this year. Um, I'm going to Poly French Polynesia in, uh, in about a month uh, for a month to document the various islands for the project I mentioned earlier in the presentation. Uh, then I am off to the Arctic and northern Russia to film polar bears uh, in late summer. And potentially, I'm going to do a tour to Churchill for uh, for guests. So if anyone here is interested in actually coming along on any expeditions, um, again, my contact was there on the page. So just message me anytime. Has, has your life or your business changed since winning the Rising Star portfolio? Oh, yeah, dramatically. I mean, the Wildlife Photographer of the Year, I almost want to say kickstarted my photography career I mean I've been doing it for 17 18 years um but with the recognition of the contest sort of even uh organizations companies magazines that I've reached out to in the past all of a sudden they were a lot more interested in, in talking to me and that has been huge and a part of the reason why I have so many expeditions planned for this year is because of the wildlife photographer of the year which is why I said you know even if you don't think you're going to win, enter, because who knows, maybe you are, and it will, it will change your life. Okay, so there's a lot of, a lot of equipment questions here. I'm going to try and narrow it down. <laughs> what brand do you use? What's your favorite lens to use? And does that even apply to you anymore? It's not like you're just using a DSLR anymore. You've got a lot of stuff in, in the locker. Yeah, exactly. Like, look, equipment just we collected over the years, you know, custom equipment, switches, uh, remotes that actually are brand less almost, I want to say, or just little Kickstarter campaigns. But I mean, I use a Nikon camera. I've always been a Nikon guy. My dad has been using their equipment. And then when I, you know, 
ultimately stole his camera. It was a Nikon. So uh, I've been using that. Uh, right now it's a D850, um, my favorite lens. Uh, I don't have a huge budget. I mean, I use it all on these expeditions. So I don't have, you know, the long, you know, $10,000 lenses. I have a $1,500, 200, 500, which serves me great. Uh, and again, coming down to what I discussed earlier in the presentation, it doesn't matter what equipment you are using as long as you sort of have the vision for that picture. Great, great idea. Okay. Do you, did you come across any bears that were not thriving that you might attribute to climate change? Not in the part of the Hudson Bay we are, we've been seeing them. Uh, I mean, I've seen young cubs, huge uh, two-year-old cubs with their moms, all very healthy in different parts of the Arctic. I can't say I've seen the same. I have seen, um, you know, malnourished bears, uh, other things. I um, <laughs> don't really want to discuss, but... Um, of course, you know, if you're out in the environment for so long, you're going to see it. Um, do I know if it's exactly related to climate change or if that bear just didn't eat some or ate something wrong? I don't know. Okay, uh, that leads into the next question. What was the most difficult, i.e. disturbing or upsetting photograph or photo shoot you have ever done? That's a <laughs> that's a hard one, actually, actually to answer. I mean, there is times when, you know, like the penguin and the orcas where you're rooting for a team just because of a picture, but you also are rooting for the other team because you know how, how that must feel. Um, I don't really have a specific situation, just those moments where you're seeing nature unfold in front of you. You know, you're seeing a bear hunt a, a whale or a seal or you're seeing whales hunt penguins you know and you just don't know which one you want to necessarily associate with right okay uh here's a challenging question how do you think your work benefits conservation yeah i mean that's a i hope that through my pictures and especially people seeing these polar bears they have built a relationship with these animals. And that was my goal along even with, you know, like intimate moments, like the mom nursing, like the heart that those two bears have formed. I wanted people to really feel emotionally attached to these polar bears. Cause as people, we feel like we need to protect something more when we have a relationship with it, I feel. Um, so that's sort of what I'm trying to do, you know, and why I've also, or myself and my team have given all these bears names. Each one of them has a name because each one of them has a certain personality. They're not all bears. They're all individual animals that act a certain way. Um, so that has sort of been my uh, way of trying to conserve them and just by showing as much of them as possible to people and hoping uh that ultimately will care enough about them to change the way we live amazing okay um following along same thing do you know what happened well we know hercules was seen again yeah a year later do you know what happened to james i don't know what happened to james i wish i saw him again after that december shoot i have not and to be honest i have not seen a, a bald eagle that cooperative after that either um I wish I knew. I'm just happy I found out what happened to Hercules because that was like, I almost bawled my eyes out when I heard that. That was absolutely unbelievable. You know, you build that relationship with these animals and then someone comes to you and says, it's a, he's alive and doing well. You're like, well, okay. Yeah, especially given those tough conditions, you know, it is amazing that he is alive. Um, can you talk about what you don't like about your trips? what the challenges that you face just organizing and, and being there? Uh, I'm a very, I like control <laughs> and just putting myself in situations that I have absolutely zero control over has been a little challenging. I'm learning. Um, the, I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Feeling uh, has been ex just mentally, you know, physically it's challenging. You're not eating food. Like I lose maybe 10, 15 pounds every time I go on one of these trips. Um, but mentally, it's extremely draining because you're away from, you know, your family. Uh, you can't even talk to them because you just have a satellite phone. So 
all of that sort of plays into it and it's extremely challenging and those are sort of things i don't <laughs> okay two three more quick questions how much does all your equipment weigh and how big a team do you usually have uh it weighs too much <laughs> uh the patagonia the 150 kilometer trip we did my pack weighed i think 40 pounds and it was the most useless pack you have ever seen because it had almost no camping gear, no food, nothing. It was mostly camera gear. And I think two pairs of socks, one pair of underwear and a shirt. Um, again, I downsized everything just to make room for camera gear, but it weighs a lot, especially if you have to carry it on your back all the time. Yeah. Um, do you know how Hercules was injured and lost his leg in the first place? I have a hunch uh, that he was injured by a, uh, a wolf pack. Uh, these bears migrate from their dens past a bunch of wolf packs along the coast. So my assumption is that a wolf uh, probably got its, uh, its brother or sister uh, and in the process actually took uh, Hercules' leg. Potentially it could have been also another polar bear because they do males in order to breed with the female they will go after the cubs but my hunch is that it was a it was a wolf okay great um okay so a question about your favorite place to photograph in the vancouver area i know rifle is, is a really wonderful sanctuary to go to photograph do you have any other spots that you're willing to share or you're keeping them a secret? <laughs> no, I mean, that's a, a rifle is actually my favorite one. I, that's where I kept going all the time when I first started photography, rifle, Stanley Park, uh, Burnaby Lake, Deer Lake, just little places that I know where there's concentrations of wildlife uh, that are relatively easy to access. So those were sort of uh, the places that I, uh, that I like to visit around here. <laughs> Amazing, yeah. Okay, Martin, thank you very much. And thanks to everyone. And there were a lot of people today for joining us. Um, thank you again for sharing your expertise and experience today. I also want to give a special thanks to Aaron Kerr, who is in the background doing all of the hard work. And we hope to see you again at our next digital program. Details of all upcoming ROM programs, ROM at Home online programs can be found on the ROM's website and our social media channel.